thanks for joining us on the show. We hope your weekend is great because here in Nigeria, we are hope bright and shining. Welcome to Live from Abuja on TVC News. Let's also wish all our Christians faithful across the world a happy Easter celebration. I am Ademola Lawrence. The program is fully packed, loaded with lots of interesting compilation for your viewing pleasure. So stay with us for a worthwhile experience. I am Abida Lawal. I think that uh, the week has been an interesting one, most especially when you look at what uh, the president's birthday yesterday was just on a very solemn level, very low key. What's, what's your take on it's, that? It's very important as um, it, um, it um, calls for a moment of sober reflection, especially taking in co cognizance with the mood of the country. I think it was just appropriate. I think that is very good. Being appropriate, let's begin by letting you know that it was a busy week for the ECOWAS Commission here in Nigeria's capital city of Abuja, where a three-day workshop that seeks to engage member countries on strengthening response and resilience in addressing humanitarian needs of displaced persons, migrants, refugees, and other persons of concerns was opened. Member say data and information collated from the region show that population displacement resulting from varied humanitarian events, especially conflict, contributes enormously to the worsening humanitarian situation. There's more in this next piece. The number of persons of concern in the West African region have continued to increase over the years. This is due to the protracted crisis in the region, especially insurgency, terrorism and other armed attacks coupled with the effects of climate change. These factors have driven humanitarian needs to a frightening height. Protection and assistance through humanitarian access is therefore very critical to the welfare and survival of displaced persons. Let me tell you something about the director. ECOWAS, in line with its mandate of assisting member states, reduce the suffering of populations affected by humanitarian emergencies, organized this regional consultation workshop, also involving partners from the United Nations. The overall objective of this workshop is to come up with appropriate data and information on the needs of population affected by the identified challenges to further close the response gaps and reduce the sufferings, which if sustained, will ultimately close the gap in humanitarian development and the peace nexus. The shortage of essential non-food items highlights the ongoing struggle of those affected by displacement. In unity, let us renew our dedication to delivering effective humanitarian assistance to our region's most vulnerable and aspire towards a future where empathy and compassion prevail, while ensuring that no one is left behind. The vulnerable groups in the persons of consent category are the internally displaced persons, refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, and stateless persons. ECOWAS data says, as of December 2023, there are over 6 million displaced persons and almost 1 million stateless persons in the region. And just as ECOWAS is making plans to reduce humanitarian needs in the sub-region, Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubu, is also not leaving any stone unturned, as he has now approved drastic measures in dealing with the frightening trend of insecurity in Algeria. The president's directive became clear after a private meeting with the governor of Zamfara State. The governor also seeks the deployment of more troops to Zamfara and ensure the tide of banditry and kidnapping is significantly reduced. Also, President Tinumbo approved the immediate takeoff of Federal Government College of Education in Guaza, Baronun State. This compilation captures it all. As you're fully aware, a desperate governor of Zamfara State seeking an end to the prevailing insecurity in the Northwest State. It's the responsibility of the federal government. Here he tells State House correspondents the outcome of his private meeting with President Bola Tinubu. He there to direct them. Insecurity in Zamfara State has worsened. The state has become a hotbed of banditry, killings, kidnapping, and other violent crimes. 
For now, the situation has defied all solutions thrown at it. Governor Dauda Lawal says President Bola Tinubu has a personal interest in restoring peace to the state and has approved a drastic measure to eliminate all threats to the security of lives and property. We as governors, we don't have control over the military as well as the police. It's the responsibility of the federal government. And therefore, at any point, we need to inform Mr. President so that we can get his blessing either to direct them or to do something else that will help in taking care of that situation. We're doing everything to change the narratives. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. And I complain to Mr. President. And uh, I have this assurance that something drastic will be done as quickly as possible to take care of the situation. A few months ago. Governor of Borno State, Babaga Nazulum, was also a guest of the president, and he presented a wish list for his state. He told journalists in the presidential villa that President Tinubu has approved the takeoff of the Federal Government College of Education in Gwoza, and this will certainly excite people in Borno State. The president has given approval for the immediate takeoff of the Federal College of Education in Gwoza. That is something that is very important and very dear to the entire people of Borno State, so that we still have remnants of people living in Chad. Beyond improving access to education, Governor Zulum and President Tinubu also talked about the Lake Chad Basin and the need for the government to ensure the establishment of the South Chad Project, which has a capacity to produce food for the whole of northern Nigeria and bring the country closer to achieving food security. Femi Akonde, TVC News, Abuja. You are aware that the psychosocial support for 131 students rescued in Dasadu at Forest in Zabra State has entered its sixth day. However, six others are still in the hospital receiving treatment. In another development, Governor of Kaduna State, Tubasani, was in Tudumbiri to kickstart the state government intervention for the village that was mistakenly bombed. There is more in this next story. The Kaduna government is currently giving psychosocial support to the 137 Kuriga school children who regained their freedom after 17 days in captivity. But they have also now turned their attention to Tudumbiri, the village mistakenly bombed by the Nigerian army on December 3rd. Governor Obasani on Tuesday visited the village to kickstart the construction of a 5.5 kilometer road as well as a skill center aimed at providing training opportunities for the youths. This road we are doing the groundbreaking today, which is about 5.5 uh, kilometer asphalt road, will certainly help the people of this community so that the travel time from this very important community to the town will be reduced. Movement of goods will also be eased. And most of the people that will participate are the people of the building community, so there will be job creation. Additionally, a health care center is being constructed to ensure access to medical services for the community. Health care is one of the most important areas we are also focusing on. That is the reason why we budgeted about 15% of our budget to health care. And today, as part of our plan, to ensure that people don't travel more than one kilometer to assess Despite the tragic loss of 81 villagers due to the mistaken bombing, locals expressed satisfaction with government's efforts in addressing the situation and providing support during this difficult time. We are very, very satisfied because we are achieving what we are looking for. And always when we go to, uh, when we go to government house to, to, to tell him what's, what has happened, uh, what is what our problem? He will stay and hear our problem and solve the problem for us. More interventions will be coming to this village in the coming days, such as the Pulaku Initiative, which was promised by the federal government. Lupe Asom. For more on these developments, we will be talking to a retired group captain and counterterrorism expert, Captain Sadiq Shewu, who will join us live on Zoom from Kaduna after this break. We'll be right back.
All right, thank you for joining us back on the show. I was still trying to connect with our retired group captain, Sad uh, Sadiq Shewu. Of course, we'll be talking about insecurity. But in the meantime, there's, uh, of course, today is the Holy Saturday, and it's the eve of Easter, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is a significant season for Christians, and it also culminates the Lenten period. There's more in this next piece. The Lenten season started on the 14th of February with the Ash Wednesday. It is a 40-day season when Christians seek God in prayer, serve God and humanity through almsgiving and practice self-control through fasting and abstinence. Solely emphasize during the Lenten season that you intensify what you have been doing. It's not just that you are doing it for the first time, that you have been praying, you have been fasting, you have been giving alms, but this time, double it or triple it. Do it more. Lenten season is characterized by some age-long traditions, like the covering up of holy images in the Catholic Church from the Saturday of the fifth week in Lent until Good Friday, signifying Jesus' withdrawal before his eventual arrest. The seventh Sunday of Lent is Palm Sunday, when the Catholic Church observed Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. <laughs> This is followed by the Holy Thursday, which marks the end of the Lenten season and the beginning of the sacred Triduum, the three days that precede Easter. On Holy Thursday, the Archbishop or Bishop in every diocese celebrates the Chrisian Mass, rededicating the priests to God, and later in the evening, the Mass of the Last Supper, where the priest washes the feet of 12 members of the church, reenacting the mandatum, Christ's command, to his apostles to love one another as he loved them. For some years now, over 20 years, and uh, each year I've been doing this, and I see needs, okay, opportunities for me to renew myself, to also re-examine myself, to evaluate myself, and also to re-empower myself, and to tell God, into your hands I commit my priestly ministry. It's a day of renewal, so we we renew our commitment and we also have assurances of God's help. Okay, gather together around the bishop, we, we ask for God's help. And one of the things bishop does is to ask God's people to pray for the priest. Beyond the clergy, the lay faithful also participate in the various programs within the Lenten season and the Easter Triduum, like the Good Friday veneration of the crucifix, a replica of Jesus and the cross by kissing, touching, or a deep bow. These practices aim to impact their interior life. The Lenten season, music-wise, we go a bit solemn. The songs and hymns are contemplative, reflective, and um, uh, they're meant to remind us of the passion of Christ, the suffering, just to make sure that man was redeemed after the fall of man. The Lenten experience is uh when we are most, most conscious of our ordinary Christian life, a heightened um, experience in, uh, in our trying, our rising and falling, you know, trying to uh, dis rediscover our identity, our, where we fit in in the context of the uh, salvation history. There were lots of things that happened to me that made me to realize that I, I've been missing all these years. So this Lenten season for this year, drew me closer to God and made me to understand a lot of things about the church that I didn't know about before. Living through the Lenten observances and the Paschal season centered on Christ's resurrection, which gives meaning to Christian dawn, it is expected to have a lasting transforming effect on Christians. I have resolved within me that no going back, whatever it is I've learned and whatever has been impacted in me, it's not something that I'm going to drop. I'm going to continue with it. It's going to be a lifestyle for me. It's not a cloth that I wear and pull off. It's something that I'm going to carry in my heart all time. Me, because what I, what I look at is like um, seeing myself within um, the context of the early church. Because that is what this season, these seasons are about. Carrying us through the life of Christ. So I'm going to see myself again as someone sent, you know, to be the light of the world and salt of the earth. 
The somber mood of Good Friday is extended to the Holy Saturday until the Easter Vigil Mass when Christ's resurrection is celebrated. As we gradually draw the cutting in the Pascha season, how have the various programs and traditions impacted your life as a Christian going forward? Jane Francis Mweze, CVC News, Abuja. Let's bring you excerpts from the chat I had with the Archbishop of Abuja Diocese, Ignatius Kaigama, who is a Nigerian prelate of the Catholic Church. Welcome to the interview segment of Live from Abuja with the Catholic Archbishop of Abuja is Grace Most Reverend Dr. Ignatius Kaigama. You're welcome, sir. Welcome, TVC. Thank you, sir. So it is Easter once again, and it's a time for Christians to feast. Tell us, Lord Bishop, what is, uh, what is Easter and what significance does it have on the Christian faith? Yes, the time of the year has come again, and we give God glory and praise. For the past weeks, Christians have been in the penitential mood of the Lenten season, the period of Lent, and it is culminating with this Holy Week. Beginning from Sunday, we celebrated the Palm Sunday, which is called Passion Sunday, and gradually moving towards Easter, which is the high peak, the point, high peak. And Easter is about Jesus, Jesus having triumphantly entered Jerusalem. We were told they were clapping, singing, welcoming him with palms, even throwing their clothes so that he could go on them. He entered Jerusalem and then he was condemned to death. He suffered and he carried his cross to Calvary and there he was crucified. The good thing is that he didn't end his story. That was just actually the beginning. He died, he was buried, but three days later he rose. And that is showing victory over death, victory over sin, victory over the evil one. And that is what we celebrate at Easter, that Jesus is alive. And Jesus, with Jesus you can never fail. With Jesus, you can never be a loser. Even things, when things are hard, difficult, challenging, cling on to Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So we celebrate him at Easter, believing he is alive, he is all over the world, he is present, and therefore we shouldn't be downcast. Now, Your Grace, Christ uh, is uh, a perfect example as Christians uh, celebrating Easter. Uh, Easter biblical as um, believers. Um, is Christ a, a perfect example as Christian celebrates? Absolutely. He's the Son of God. He became man. God sent him deliberately to assume the condition of a human being. We call it the incarnation. He became incarnate and therefore he wanted to be like us so that he will see us from that perspective. And whatever he did as a human being was an example to us. So he's a model for excellence. Namely, he taught us how to pray. He taught us how to fight temptation. See, the devil in the desert tempting him to do this, do that. He taught us how to be firm, how to resist the evil one. He taught us how to love, see how he went about doing good, how he, um, you know, supported the weak, lifted those who were marginalized and downcast, and he healed those who were sick, provided food for those who needed. So he was a perfect model, not just any model, but a model that was um, very, very perfect and wanted us to follow his way, to worship God his way and also to serve fellow human beings his way. And if we do that, there will be no problem with us, Christians or Muslims fighting, 
this tribe or that tribe fighting, I tell you that will be gone forever. So let us focus on Christ and his message. Now this year Easter celebration comes amidst the economic um, hardship, which is due to the free fall of Nera and this inflation. What is your take on this and do you feel it will affect the celebration compared to how it is done in the past? It will certainly because um, people have very little. They go to the market, they buy the small major rice that they could afford. They cannot now. The beans, the corn, and everything. Even the corn, the rose by the roadside, you go, the they, they price has gone up so high that you cannot even afford that corn to eat. And so things are not well. And we are people of hope. That's why I told you Easter is to tell us that we cannot give up. We cannot become so frustrated that we feel there's no hope. We are people of prayers, we are people of hope. We are praying and hoping that our leaders are watching and our leaders will see the sufferings of the people, that our leaders will ensure that governance is about providing resources for the people, looking after their welfare and being judicious in the expenditures they do so that these resources can go around. So we keep praying and hoping that things will turn out better. And uh, we call on our leaders while we are praying, please do the acting. Act well, govern well, be prudent in managing the resources that God has entrusted into your hands on behalf of all Nigerians. Do that well and there will be peace, there will be harmony and joy will flow like a river. Your Grace, do you think um, Nigerian Christians are more religious than spiritual when it comes to the real practice of Christianity? Yeah, we carry religion as a tag. You know, somebody wants to be seen as a Christian, so he or she appears as a Christian with all kinds of images on his body. Somebody wants to be seen as a Muslim, wears something that shows he's Muslim. But I say that is externalism. That is what the scribes and the Pharisees practice, and Jesus condemned that that does not bring about transformation and renewal of life. Religion is when you listen to God and you are able to serve him and you are able to draw inspiration from him and that leads you to uh, touch the lives of fellow human beings. So we have the vertical version of religion whereby you are relating with God at the vertical level but you must come down at the horizontal level to touch lives. That neighbor, that person you see, whether it's from the east or from the west or from the north, see that person as a person with dignity, a person made in the image and likeness of God. But we don't seem to care. We just concentrate on our narrow group. Right? And then we feel others are bad people or enemies, and we treat them with hostility. That is not religion. So let's practice true religion, sincere religion, positive religion in Nigeria, and we shall see the difference. Now, what is your message finally to Nigerians at this period? Be hopeful, Nigeria. Somebody has told me, why do you preach hope? I said, that is the only thing we shall hold on to, hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that uh, things can still become better. While we pray and ask people to be hopeful, we tell, also tell our leaders to do something constructive. The resources are there. It's a matter of good governance prudent management, distributive justice. Everybody should feel a sense of belonging in the country. But to get into power and alienate or marginalize certain groups because of their religious background, because of their tribal affiliations or geopolitical zone is not good, it's not healthy. So let Easter remind us that we are one, one people and one nation, that we should live in joy and even if we pass through sufferings and hardships, we believe that it will culminate in victory. Victory over hardship, victory over sin, victory over the evil one, and victory over everything that is bad. That is what Easter should point us to. Thank you very much, Your Grace. A very fine place to leave it. You're uh, welcome. And that was the Archbishop of Abuja, Daosi, Bishop Ignatius Kayagama. Of course, uh, an interesting one. Join us live in the studio for more on the significance of Easter as another northern regional pastor of Jesus Live Bible Church International, Pastor Emmanuel Moro. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Let me ask you, what, let, what do you think? Uh, the significance 
the significance of what Easter is to Christians and people around the world? Uh, Easter is, um, is so central to our Christian practice based on the fact that we celebrate Easter as a celebration of purpose. Uh, why do I say celebration of purpose? Uh, Jesus coming into the world was prophesied that he's coming, a child will be born, and that child is coming to save his people from their sin. So if you see all through his activities while on earth, it's, it culminated at the point of Easter, because that is when fulfillment took place. That is when he actually died to fulfill and bring into being the salvation of his people, as it was prophesied. And that's why I caption it that as Easter is a celebration of purpose, because if he had not died, the purpose of his coming wouldn't have been fulfilled. Now, um, Jesus died and rode, rose again, rather, on the third day as captured in the Bible. Sure. Are there specific things that Christians should be doing on this day? Yes. He, the, today, we celebrate what we call, I, I caption it as celebration of sacrifice, because he actually sacrificed his life. And whatever Jesus did while he was on earth sets an example for Christians. And so, one, we must also try to ensure that we live a sacrificial life, ensuring that we capture the interest of other persons in the course of our you know, activities on the earth. It's not all about you, but about other persons around you. How do you factor in uh, the, the problems, or how do you see yourself having an inroad into providing a solution? Because Jesus came to provide solution. So are you a solution or a problem? So as a Christian, you see within whatever is happening and try to involve you know, a process that will bring about solution and ensuring that you, whatever you do, you, you try to impact positively on the people around you, even if it means you denying yourself one or two pleasures to ensure that that is delivered to the people. I want to ask, um, why should I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You know, some persons have said that, you know, why? 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 Even non Christians, some Christians even don't really believe, you know, but why should I believe? Uh, the Bible says if you must come to Him, you must believe that He is, and that He, he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And when you talk about belief, it's a little bit broad. You can individualize it. How does it impact in your life? As for me, as a Christian, I know that my believing in Christ has transformed my life. It has made me a better person. I see myself not to have achieved or to be where I am today, if not Jesus. And you also said, how should you believe? Believe is not an imposition. Is a point of conviction. What, what has happened to you? Is it test, you know, you testify of what happened to you. Like the book of, you know, the scripture will say that which we have seen, that which we have touched, that which we have also experienced, that we testify unto you. When a man believes in something, it's not just a stereo. It has to do with your inner conviction. What has actually happened to you? Uh, we don't have the time. But if you look at persons who believe, they also have their testimonies that justifies why they believe in what they believe. And to ask you, why should you believe? Uh, well, as a Christian, it's in my place to also tell you that what I'm enjoying, I would want you to come and enjoy with me. Okay. Now, Pastor Emmanuel, without yeah. um, Easter, will there still be a Christian faith? Is the, is the basis for Christianity. Because the Bible says, if of this earth alone we are hopeful, then we are most men miserable. What keeps a Christian drive on is that a day is coming. Because Christ resurrected, even if I die here on earth, that is the hope of resurrection. The Bible says, he that believes in him, though he dies, yet shall he live again. So you discover that it's a force. 
is something that keeps, it gives you a drive and gives you hope that the day is coming when you are going to interface or when you are going to be with the Lord. So it's, it's, it's central to our Christian faith. Um, what is one unusual traditional ritual, you know, uh, that you would like to make part uh, of Easter celebration? Easter, you know, in the Jewish time, it was regarded as a festival because it coincided with the Passover. And you also know that Passover in the scripture, you know, you know um, celebrates the, the liberation of Israel from the clutches of slavery in Egypt. But as at the time, Jesus, this, Jesus, um, you know, the, the, the death, at the time of his death, it coincided with that celebration. You, you can also take it as a Passover. But for us today, in our Christian setting, whatever you call it unusual or usual, is that we engage in sensitization, in engaging, educating people. Because you, you see a situation where people celebrate a particular um, festival without really understanding what the festival is all about. So it, the onus is on us as Christians to also educate people the essence of Easter so that it can be celebrated with meaning, with understanding, so we can organize church programs, uh, we can you know, engage in out, uh, outreach to ensure that people are properly educated and enlightened on the essence of Easter. Thank you very much, Pastor Emmanuel Imoro. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Me. Happy Easter once again. Thank you so much. Happy Easter to you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Okay. And that's yeah. our conversation on Easter. And let's also tell you that uh, we now have Captain Sadiq Shewo, of course, who will be talking to us about insecurity. Uh, Captain Sadiq, can you hear me? Hello, Captain Sadiq. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Good All right, morning. thank you very much. Let, let's talk about uh, the state of insecurity. Security has been uh, here with us for a while. Now, just like in other parts of the world, uh, what is responsible for this in terms of how we are currently in Nigeria? Well, uh, without uh, excusing any criminal or terrorist act, the truth is that over the years, uh, the Nigerian society has become uh, more cosmopolitan, uh, rising figures of people out of employment, uh, increase in population, and uh, over these years, our security architecture or our security capacity has not risen pari passu to the growth that we are seeing in these sectors. So eventually, we are having security challenges that have overwhelmed what we have in place now as the security architecture. So basically, these are the things that are happening. Um, do you think there are people gaining from the security challenges in the country, or it, it is just a, a phase that we need to go through? Well, uh, for every crime, people go into crime, whatever kind, for different motives. Uh, there are people that go, like, let's, let's look at uh, messianic uh, terrorists who say they want to bring one dogma of one kind of religion. For them, it may be just spiritual, just that they want to bring a change in the thinking. For others, it is political. They want to bring a new system to replace the government. But for many, for the majority, what we are seeing is, is, is purely how to make money out of that crime. So these are the three motivations generally that you can have for somebody getting involved in a, in, in a, you know, in, in a terrorist or criminal act, political, religious, or monetary gains. Okay, so how soon do you think we can come out of these matters considering our level of intelligence gathering? Well, uh, I have to be realistic to say we may never come to, uh, you know, to a crime-free or threat-free society. There is no society that can promise that. However, it is a non-knowledge that the level of insecurity we're having in Nigeria is beyond what, I mean, normal life can go with. It is something that will affect our economy. It will something that, affect, that will affect all aspects of our life. So definitely there has to be concerted effort, or I can say more concerted effort, to ensure that uh, the insecurity is brought down to acceptable level. Remember, I said there is no society that is crime-free or security 100% secure. But the level of our own right now, it is, uh, you know, intolerable. 
Captain Sadiq, we've had so many summits on security. And has this really helped or it hasn't? It has not helped. Because what we normally do, uh, we do respect whenever we say we have summit, it is as a result of one dastardly attack or one incident. Then the National Assembly will say they are looking for the, uh, for the security agencies or the service chiefs or the IGP. And then uh, the president will make a statement. All other people will condemn the statement. Politicians will condemn the statement. But then we relapse. We forget that before the, work, the current one we are talking about, there have been other incidents for which we made so many premises, but uh, we didn't uh, deliver anything. So uh, unfortunately, what we are saying is a knee-jerk approach. We tend to forget. Not only the leaders, even Nigerians, from, you know, we, we have a very short uh, memory, memory, memory length. If something happens, the last time we were having a spanking of uh, uh, the, the bombing in, in Kuriga, as soon as that one went, we moved to the uh, snatching of the school children in Kuriga. After that, we are talking of the killing of our security uh, personnel in Delta State. So when you look, even from the media, what happens is this one bad event will replace another. And then all attention will shift to that one. Then we'll call meetings. National Assembly will call and express their displeasure. But then what do we do? Do we keep account from the last time that the, the, the security agencies were called or when the president made the statement, what did we do? Okay, uh, I just wanted to ask, you said that what you're trying to say is that, you know, there's too much of security summits and nothing is being done. So if we don't talk about it, what else can we do? Uh, because if people keep complaining that we, you know, there's so much summit. So what else, if people don't talk about it, what else do we do uh, to address the situation? I think we lost um, Captain Sadiq. Okay, so, so Captain, I was saying that, you know, if we actually don't talk about this, you said, you no, know, there's too much of security summit that we have had. If we don't talk about the situation, how then do we not address the situation if we don't talk about it? Uh, please get to me very correctly. I didn't say we shouldn't talk about it, but there's a talk shop, there's a do shop. When you talk, when an incident happens, you investigate it, you talk, you criticize, and then you find out the reason why did it happen. Then you will resolve within your mind that this will not happen again. So for that not to happen again, what are we going to do immediately? What are we going to do in the medium term? What are we going to do in the, in the long term? This is what I am saying. The talking is quite quirky. You must talk about security because it is about life and, uh, and, and, and properties. Without security, you don't have anything. But it's talking and not doing anything that I'm against. Is talking and promising without a plan is what I'm thinking. Without timeline, if you don't have a work plan, you will talk. That will pass, another one will happen, and then you will talk again. So the talking is okay, and the talking, in fact, it is compulsory. We have to talk because there's nothing better than security. But what do we do? Do we have a plan after we talk? Do we have uh, indices? Do we have timelines? Do we have deliverables? Do we go back and say, okay, we have done this, we have not done that? From the National Assembly, to the executive branch, with due respect, I do not see us being that. That is my opinion. Now, Captain, President Tinubu wants kidnappers to be treated as terrorists. How significant is this call? Well, uh, it shows the exasperation of, uh, of Mr. President. But again, like I said, for those that keep a uh, record, the last government, there was even a bill that was passed that uh, bandits are no longer bandits, they are terrorists. So I think we are working the same assembly. So it is not, uh, yes, I agree, it is the exasperation shown by the president that's making him say that, but it's a step that has already been taken. But beyond the declaring terrorists, I mean, bandits are terrorists, what do we do? What has changed in tackling them? That is my issue. In fact, again, me, if you ask me, I think uh, whether we say they are terrorists or they are not terrorists, I think we are doing all that we can do within current capacity. Yeah, so what is missing? is that the current capacity is not enough to confront the threat. So whether you call them friends, whether you call them enemies, whether you call them terrorists, if the capacity, if the way of doing things is not changed, uh, such mere proclamation will not uh, solve the problem. Thank you very much, Captain Sadiq Sheu. A very fine place to leave it, um, talking about insecurity in Kaduna State and other parts of the country.
Moving on, the federal government says it is dedicated to transforming the country into a leading global food producer. This was the conclusion of agricultural stakeholders at the inception workshop on reducing open field burning in Nigeria, where over 195,000 U.S. dollars has already been sourced. <laughs> From flooding, air pollution, wildfires to severe heat waves, this phenomenon occasioned by climate change threatens the very existence of humanity. One of such causes of this degradation is open field burning, where farmers set fire to clear stubble, weeds and waste before planting a new crop. Although this has been an age-long practice, agricultural experts and stakeholders at this workshop describe the practice as highly unsustainable, and here is why. We know that when people burn their farm waste, um, it can cause a lot of uh, health issues and environmental issues. So this project is an 18-month pilot uh, to work with 500 farmers uh, in Boko. But the learnings from this project is going to be uh, across Nigeria. That's why we're having the launch today. We have people from Ministry of Agriculture from all over, from all the six geopolitical zones. Addressing this issue of paramount concern to Nigeria's agricultural ministry and is poised to extend increased support to agencies directly involved in combating open field burning. And we have some of these NGOs and some of these development partners that are willing eh, to partake in some of these activities. And that's why we are having this project here. Because this is being sponsored by the CACC, which is Climate and Clean Air Coalition, uh, which is an organization that is funded by so many countries. So when we target the 500, we will target the overall people of uh, Boko as well through a lot of sensitization. Now the action point is being taken to the field with a planned pilot training of farmers in Benue State on the detrimental effects of short-lived climate pollutants resulting from open field burning. Uh, yeah, there have been uh, a lot of uh, uh, meetings worldwide to think about how to mitigate uh, um, the issues of climate and then uh, to see that uh, greenhouse gas emissions is mitigated and the, the reduction of all these problems. So we are going to be working as a pilot in Benue State and in Boko local government area uh, to start with and we are looking at cascading this knowledge and the learnings to the entire country. This kind of meeting will be valuable for real farmers and can promote the agricultural sector and boost food security if well executed. Uloma Oyemachi, TVC News, Abuja. And now let's talk about some headline news. The defense headquarters has declared eight people wanted over the recent killings of 17 military personnel in Delta State. The military authority announced these in a circular posted on official Facebook page of the Nigerian Army on Thursday. The Minister of Solid Minerals Development, Dele Alake, has directed mining new marshals drawn from the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps, NSCDC, to smoke out illegal miners and all those who flout the nation's mining laws. Mr. Alake gave the directive while inaugurating the first batch of mining marshals drawn from the NSCDC to combat illegal mining. And the Naira appreciated further against the United States dollar across foreign exchange markets on Wednesday. Data gathered from both market segments showed, according to the market data published on the FMDQ website, Naira closed on Wednesday at $1,303 against $1,382 uh, recorded in the previous market session on Tuesday. Now, Governor of Ogun State, Dakpo Abiodun, has promised to commence the sale of rice to residents at half price. Mr. Abiodun said the move is to cushion the prevalent economic hardship and challenges in the country. He explained that his administration is selling at a 50% discount to allow it to continue to buy more rice to be sold to residents. And outside Nigeria, the bodies of two people have been recovered from a red pickup truck which was on the water where the Baltimore uh, bridge collapsed. Its construction workers were on the bridge when the ship struck it, plunging them into the waters below. Two of the workers were rescued on day, uh, but the search continues for the other four are presumed dead.
Very sad indeed. Now, Russia attacks northeastern city of Kharkiv with aerial bombs on Wednesday for the first time since 2022, killing at least one civilian and wounding 16 others, local officials said. Okay, we'll now go to sport, and of course, Jane is here with us. Well, Demola, good morning, and of course, uh, it's a very exciting, maybe, moment for a lot of people coming from the international break and other things happening in the world of sports. What's, what's, what's the update? Well, of course, we're looking at who the Super Eagles would be appointing as the coach, uh, substantive coach for, um, uh, rather, the Nigerian Football Federation will be appointing as a substantive coach for the Super Eagles. Interesting. Interesting. And the Super Eagles of Nigeria have been without a coach since the 1st of March when the contract of the former manager, Jose Pesiro, ran out. Assistant coach of the Eagles, Finiti George, acted in the interim for the friendly games against Ghana and Mali played in Marrakech, Morocco. With one win and a loss in the two games, opinions are divided on the Nigeria Football Federation giving him a contract. Nigerians await the Nigeria Football Federation's announcement of a substantive coach for the senior men's team, the Super Eagles, ahead of the team's 2026 World Cup qualifier against Bafana Bafana of South Africa in the first week of June. Too early to judge any coach. You can you can judge a coach with two games. I don't I don't think it's right for anybody to say he, he has done well or he has not done well. The days are too early. I think with the two games he's taking charge, as well with the game against Ghana, we played some very free flowing sweet football um, that I enjoyed personally. But against Mali, I couldn't really see what the team was going to um, do. We are ready. When will we be ready? Is it in 40 years time? For 20 years, we must give our indigenous coach a space. If we can encourage them the way we encourage foreign coaches. Okay, I think that it's a good one. Uh, if Nigeria can get uh, an inter a, a substantive coach, um, Fini George has done his best. Let's get this in, the, in the last two games, but but, but you know the, the question would always be: Should we get indigenous? Should we still go for a foreign coach? And um, if we're not getting someone on the level of maybe a certain Pep Guardiola at this point, well, you know? I, I also think that we've been playing um, testing uh, waters, and um, we've just been in and out. We've not really had. Um, um, someone who can do the job fully, I would say. Well, it's, it's very difficult, you know, to pass the judgment. Football is um, um, growing across the continent also, and there's just a lot of factors. So it's not, it doesn't start at the Super Eagles level. What are we doing for grassroots development and having a football culture? But before we just move out of sport, I think the, the, the biggest game of the weekend, Man City Arsenal. <laughs> Why are you smiling? Well, the, the coaches have Why are you it. smiling? The coaches have had their say, Demola, and you know what the outcome would be. Why do you want to hear it from me? I don't me? know. Well, of course, the better team will win. <laughs> okay, let's now take you through a bit of trending stories and the world of entertainment. Renowned Nigerian musician Onyeka Oweno says she's working on a, producing a film that will delve into her experience which span decades within the music industry. With a career that stretches back to the 1970s, the elegant stallion expressed her eagerness to share a first hand account of the evolution of Nigerian music through upcoming movie. The movie star said, I am currently working on a film that will chronicle my experience in the music industry from the 70s to the present day. Having been part of the narrative uh, for decades, I have wealth of stories to share. Interesting. Some exciting news for Big Brother fans as Biggie is back for BB Ninja Season 9 auditions mm. with a twist. The audition requires two people. The announcement said this year it's a search for dynamic duos that love the show and can turn up the heat in Biggie's house. With this new twist to application videos, which used to be a single person in the video, candidates will have to apply in pairs this means that the audition video will feature two candidates each. I wish I could be able to go, but I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> then since breaking into the international scene in 2018, the Nigerian music superstar Burna Boy has become the first African artist to have three of his albums surpass 
400 million streams on Spotify. He achieved this feat after his seventh album, I Told Them, which spawned uh, the hit song City Boy, surpassing 400 million streams. The album joins his fourth album, African Jan, and sixth album, Love Damini, as album as that have crossed the 400 million streaming mark. Well, American rapper Sean Diddy Combs, homes in L.A. and Miami were raided by federal authorities yesterday on Monday, 25th March 2024. Viral videos showed Homeland Security investigation agents conducting their operations in the 17,000 square foot mansion. His sons were also seen being taken out of the premises in handcuffs, but the rapper was nowhere to be found. Two law enforcement officials revealed that the Federal Homeland Security Investigation agents and other law enforcement were conducting searches of the properties as part of a sex trafficking investigation. However, the officials were not authorized to publicly dis discuss details of the ongoing investigation. It is still not clear whether Combs was the target of the investigation. And several celebrities and netizens alike have slammed judges for awarding trans woman Bob Risky, the best dressed woman at the Beast of Two Worlds movie premiere. <laughs> they expressed their dismay regarding the award, stressing that the socialite was not the right fit for the category. At the premiere, Bob Risky spotted a long statement, secreted, gown with matching black lipstick and won the female category. While Big Brother and Anja are alumni, Groovy won in the male category. Interesting conversation. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I don't know how to say this, but I don't know how to say this. I think that has generated lots of controversy and even there were um, backlash from religion uh, bodies as well. Um, um, it's a, it's a, I don't know, I don't know what to, what to make of it. It's really hard, Jane, to, uh, to really blame one, uh, one of the parties that are involved. There were so many people involved. Well, of course, so, um, I, I think for the movie, you know, for the movie people, it, it generated more, um, conversations for them because you could argue either way. I mean, they'd say Bob is a cross-dresser, so, but... She wore whatever she wore better than the women. That's the argument the judges are going to make. So it's it's like you said, it's neither here nor there. So I noticed you said it. She, 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 <laughs> the shame. <laughs> it's a shame. As that, no, but, but no, then no, no, somebody no, benefited no, from no, all of this. No, no, no. Somebody let's, benefited let's from even, all of this because I'm surprised you said better. she wore. No, no. she's shame. Well, and this is so, well. So, <laughs> for all we know, Bob Risky won the best dressed female. No, no, but, but so no. I'd have to address. No, no, but, but I'd have to address <laughs> Bob Risky as a but she. But I think Enola Jawa has also come out with an apology and saying that because what she wanted was just a boss for a, a boss for our movie coming up. But Jane is but, is, but the, is, but is Bob Risky is, a, a, a he or a she? I don't think we can decide that this morning. But I, was going I, don't, to say, I don't understand. But I was going to say... No, 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 no. I, I, don't I was know. going to say that, um, you know, Portable um, probably got something out of this because he just got a, a new message yes. compatible um, from one of his fans because it was one of the very vocal persons about yeah, why should Bob Risky... I, I, I also movie. think that to, to all the women, to all the women, you want to apologize. Be I'm serious. Because we really need to tell Gender apology. misrepresentation. I'm telling you because <laughs> how can you know it's not done? Well, so if, because I think so, that's, that's so why the Bob Risky, because I don't want to fall into the he she argument, but Bob Risky is a shame. Identified as a woman, it's a shame at the program okay. and whatever Bob Risky wore mm. was if, uh, no. out was no, better if, than whatever if Bob Risky lady was a the she. There won't have been a need for the apology. I also, Do you understand? I, I also think um, there, 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 there are people that have identified as different things um, in the world today. We've seen so many, many of them. Very fine place to leave it. Well, very fine place to leave it indeed. Shim, very fine place to leave it. So thank you very much for joining us on the show. I uh, will bring you another interesting one next week as we bring you... Uh, take you to this uh, world of sports, entertainment, lifestyle, and of course, politics. My name is Ademola Lawrence.
I am Habida Lawal. And I am Jane Francis. See you next week.